thank you guys. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. I'm honored to be here to, uh, to speak to you guys today. Uh, I'm talking about thanking God in difficult circumstances. And uh, that can be easier said than done sometimes. And I know that can be a difficult thing to do. It takes uh, some time in the word. It takes some maturity. It takes godly men to come around you and encourage you. But uh, before I get started here today, I'd just really like to open us up in prayer. So Father God, we just thank you right now for this time to fellowship together, Lord. Iron sharpens iron. That's why we're here today as men of God to stand boldly for you, to come together, to sharpen one another. We just ask for your Holy Spirit to be here today, Lord, that you move and you bless our time together. And uh, just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> so a little bit about me, guys. Many of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, I've spoken here one, one time before. I spoke about uh, my father and the loss of my father. I've gone through some hardships in my life, so I really just wanted to share some of those things with you so that you would know uh, what I'm speaking about today. I, it, I've really had to go through some things. Uh, just to start off, uh, I wanted to show you a picture of my family. I'm really blessed. I have uh, a wife and two kids. Um, this is my family right here. This is a picture from Washington, D.C. I was really blessed this year to take my family to Washington, show them the, the history of our country. We got to visit, visit some Civil War battlefields like Get Gettysburg and different things. Um, and this picture here, this is 25 years since I went to Washington, D.C. with my father. This next picture, this is a picture of me and my dad in Washington, D.C., October. Oop, that's my daughter. Uh, October 4th, 1997. This is me and my dad in Washington, D.C. at Promise Keepers. If anyone knows what Promise Keepers is, it's a group of men who want to stand firmly uh, with God. We were in Washington, D.C. There was over a million men there, that is what they said. And uh, anyway, it was really special for me this year to take my family to D.C. because it brought back a lot of memories and uh, uh, just spending that time with my father. Um, I lost my father in 2004 to a six-month battle in cancer. I was 27. He was 57. This picture was taken in 1997. So he passed away seven years after that, to put that into perspective. I'm going to talk about that briefly today. This is a picture of my daughter. 2014, she had to go through open heart surgery. This is her coming out of surgery. Just to put it in perspective, it was a really hard thing for me to go through. She was four and a half years old, routine doctor's appointment. We went to the doctor, heard something in her heart. The doctor, no big deal. Might be just a murmur. We suggest you get it checked. A few weeks later, my wife took her to a cardiologist. They took her in the back. They're doing an echocardiogram. And uh, I didn't go to the appointment because the doctor said it wasn't, it, probably nothing big. I get a phone call at work. My wife's hysterical. She can't even talk. The doctor gets on the phone with me and tells me my da daughter has a major heart defect. Atrial septical, septal defect is what they call that. It's a hole in her heart about the size of a silver dollar. She also had a really bad leaky heart valve. Her heart was three times the size that it was supposed to be, so it was enlarged. And uh, she was just really struggling to get the blood going through her body because uh, the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood were just mixing together. It was a really hard time. So this is a picture of her coming out of open heart surgery. And um, I really wanted to show this because it really just puts into perspective what it was like when we went through that. Um, this is her coming out of surgery and what her room looked like. Now I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, but, excuse me, praise God, he answered our prayer, and my little girl was healed from the surgery. So I went through a time with the loss of my father, didn't get the answer to that prayer that I wanted, but I did hear, and I thank God during both of those circumstances, and praise God, I have one more picture I'll show you, um, this is my daughter just a few months after that surgery, graduated, graduating preschool. So praise God. Can we, yeah, can we give him the glory? Amen. So I, I really show you those pictures to kind of put things into perspective because that's, I really wanted to bring my testimony into this message. And so uh, what has God shown me through my life? What has he done with my circumstances to teach me about my walk, to mature my faith to where I can give thanks in difficult circumstances? So let me start with my dad. When I went through that circumstance, when I first found out that he was sick, I was 27 years old. I remember the elders came to my, my dad's house and we prayed over him. And here I am praying, like, God, heal my father, heal my father, heal my father. That prayers were all about me at that time in my life, right? Well, the elders came in and they started praying for my dad as well. And one of the elders was praying over, you know, praying for God's will to be done, whatever that might be. And he was talking and praying like, Lord, if it's, it's your will to, to bring my dad into his presence, that he helps my dad through that difficult time. 
and that he eases his pain and suffering. And here I am, 27 years old, I'm like, what is this dude praying? What do you mean God's will? Why wouldn't God heal my dad, right? That's where I was at, at my faith at that time. And my dad passed away after a six month battle. And I think I spent about two years kind of angry with God during that period of my life. I never turned my back on my faith. Um, I, I maybe had some questions about God and why he would do something like that. So, but I never turned my back on him. And it was about two years after my dad had passed. I remember being in a small group. We were going through something in the book of James. And I really just felt the Holy Spirit come over me. And the Lord just told me, two years I, I spent angry. You prayed for healing over your father. And that's exactly what I gave him. That's the message that God gave me. You prayed for physical healing. I gave your father the ultimate healing. I brought him into my presence. He's here in heaven with me where there's no pain. There's no suffering, nothing. He's in a place of perfect peace in the presence of God. Amen? Amen. God turned my perspective around and I, it changed the way that I was looking at my circumstance. Because up until that m moment, in two years, I feel like I'm like, why did you let me waste two years of my life, Lord, before you gave me that message? Because God uses our circumstances to grow us and mold us. He talks about that in the book of James as well. Consider it pure joy when you go through trials and tribulations because God is gonna use that time to grow your faith. But I came back and I, I've changed my perspective on looking at my situation with my father. And instead of being so focused on anger for what I lost, I changed that to thanksgiving and thanking God for what I had. So I changed my perspective from what I lost to what God had given me. What could I be thankful for? The fact that I even had a father, that I had a father for 27 years, that I had a father that not only was a good father, but he loved the Lord. And he impressed the Lord upon me and, and introduced me to the Lord and was, it was a man of faith. So I, I just started changing my perspective instead of focusing on my problem and everything that I didn't have, I just began praising God for what he did give me, amen? amen. So that was one of the first lessons God gave me. Um, continued on with my journey. I'll, I'll share one other thing about some of the trials that I faced in life. Um, I've been married 21 years, have a wonderful wife. She's, I, I, I am blessed. I married up and uh, I don't deserve her, but uh, she is a pillar. She supports me. I love her and uh, I'm just incredibly blessed. But um, early on in our marriage, we really struggled. Um, not, not just with marital issues like everybody does, but God's the centerpiece of our marriage, but we struggled because of fertility issues. It was a really tough time for us because we really wanted children. And we went a period of five years without being able to conceive. And we were just about ready to give up on God and just turn it over to him when he blessed us with our first child. So going through that period of my life, that was a really difficult time as well. And just about the time I was ready to give up, God blessed me. Praise God, right? Four months after my son was born, she got pregnant again. So I had two beautiful children, as you guys saw. We wanted more kids. It just wasn't in the cards for us. So another trial that we faced is my wife had several miscarriages after my first two kids. And that was a really difficult thing, especially for her, uh, but for both of us. And as I look back, God changed my perspective at that time as well. Instead of focusing on what I lost with those kids, I began to transition that to thanking God what he gave me with my two other kids. But even if he hadn't given me two wonderful kids, what else could I be thankful for God? For my marriage, for God's promises, for the hope, that he gives us, that he promises that he, to sustain us through the hardships, the trials of life. So fast forward that to 2014 when my daughter's four and a half years old. And that difficult call comes in with the open heart surgery. Here I am praying for healing over my girl, my little baby girl. And I recall what God's taught me up to this point in life. And I, and I do remember praying and giving God some thanks, but really I was really focused on praying according to God's will at the time before her surgery. And when she came out of surgery and she was in that room from the pictures I just showed you, I'm looking at my little girl and the nurse comes in and she, my, my, I, this was in Dallas, Texas at the time. We lived in Dallas. We were at this hospital called Medical City and they had a special pediatric ward for heart patients. My daughter at four and a half years old was the oldest patient they had in this ward. Most of the kids were brand newborn babies, like just a few months old. And th this unit really specialized in pediatric care related to congenital heart defects. And I asked the nurse, there was about a dozen rooms in this ICU unit where my daughter was recovering, like, you know, what, what, what other types of kids are in here? What other types of heart problems are kids dealing with? And she shares with me that some of the kids have heart problems that 
they're able to surgically fix like my daughter, but there's others that are having permanent heart defects where the kids are gonna grow up and they won't be able to do like sports um, or limited activities. And then there's other kids that those parents are just getting more time. They have heart defects that they're not surgically able to repair. And they're just trying to give the, the parents a little more time with their kids. That hit me because here I am in a room where God is answering my prayer and I realize there's parents in the hospital on the floor that I'm with that God, they're not getting the same answer that I am, right? As I just began, I just dropped to my knees. I just began to thank God for what he did for me. I began to pray for those other parents in that room, but it's all about perspective, right? We're so focused on our problems when we don't, when we, when God opens our eyes and we, we start looking around and we see that maybe, you know, our problems seem really bad, but there, there, there might be someone going through something a little bit more difficult than us, right? So I didn't get the answer I wanted with my father, but I did with my daughter, and I'm extremely grateful for that. And God's used these circumstances to grow my faith and, and mature me so that when I do face difficulties, what's my perspective now? I'm in a spirit of praise, a spirit of thanksgiving, even in the midst of my trial. I'm confident that I can face anything, whether that's a relationship issue um, a health issue, a tragic accident, something. I, I'm confident that I can be thankful to the Lord and tr- put my faith in him and thank him that I know he's going to comfort me, sustain me, and that my true focus is going to be on heaven. I'm going to keep an eternal perspective. That's what I'm going to do. My focus is on heaven, the promises that God gave me, the place that he's prepared for all of us, right? So going through those, thanking God, appreciating what he's given us, maintaining that mindset. The last thing God taught me through this was being available to God in the midst of our trials, in the midst of our circumstance, to where God can use that to impact others. What do I mean by that? I wouldn't change anything in my past, anything that's led up to where I'm at in my faith today, but I do have a regret in my daughter's surgery. When I came, I remember she was in there several days. I came out and I felt, I saw a couple with a little baby sitting outside in the main area of this ICU unit. And I really felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to talk to that couple. I didn't do it. I wasn't strong enough. I wasn't bold enough. I wasn't mature enough in my faith to follow that prompting by God. And I don't know why God prompted me. Maybe, I, maybe that couple just needed encouragement. Maybe they needed a little prayer. But what if that couple was that a moment in their life, a circumstance in their life that God brought them to you and to, and it was in that very moment that they were ready to hear a message of faith and salvation and they were ready to accept the Lord Jesus Christ and God wanted to use me to minister to those people, to that couple. I can't go back and change that. We have a graceful God. He loves us. We all fall short. Why do I share that with you guys? because I don't want that to happen again. I don't want that regret to step in again. If I'm in the midst of a struggle, I not, I not only wanna be at a place where I can thank God for the promises that he's given me, for the strength to endure, but I also wanna be available for God to use me as a vessel to minister to others, even in the midst of my struggle. If you don't think you can do that, I'm here to challenge you and say, yes, you can. God wants us to be at that level. It's easier said than done, right? But I don't want to miss another opportunity to share my faith and have an impact on somebody, whether that's to encourage them, to lift them up, because that's really a driving force in my life as part of my life mission statement, to love God, to love my family, to love people, but to be bold in my faith, to encourage and pray for others. That's, that's what I want to live for. I don't want to miss an opportunity to encourage others. I don't want to miss an opportunity to be bold in my faith. And I don't want to miss an opportunity to share my faith when God's called me to do that. So God is using our circumstances for his greater good. Let me repeat that. God is using your difficult circumstances for his greater good. And he promises that in scripture. Romans 8, 28 says, and God causes all things to work together for good for those that love him. And I come back to... um, I got several scriptures up here, but, in, you know, when they talk about, in Luke, they talk about, you know, God's, Jesus's purpose. He came to what? Seek and save the lost, right? 
God sent his son to be the ultimate sacrifice for each of us to seek and save the lost. So once you come to know Jesus and Jesus is in your heart and his mission has been met in your life, is it over? That's just the beginning. Once God's mission is met in your heart and you come to know Jesus, he's going to use your life, your circumstances for his greater good to impact others. He wants to use your circumstances for testimony, as a testimony to your faith so that you can share that with others and his mission can be met in others through you. His spirit is alive in us, right? Amen. 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 Thank you for that. So Jesus is alive in us. We are his hands and feet. Is he physically present right now on this earth? He's at the right hand of God, but his spirit is very much alive in us. I don't know if you've ever thought about your faith that, in that way, but you are the hands and feet of Jesus because he's alive in you and he wants to use your life to share your faith and impact others. So if you're listening to this message right now and you're like, Kirk, that sounds great. You know, you, you want to be at a spiritual maturity level where you can thank God in difficult circumstances, be mature enough that not only will you be thankful and praising God during that time, but you, you want me to go minister or maybe even pray through, for others while I'm going through this difficulty? Yeah, I, that's exactly what I think God wants us to get to. Proverbs says, he who refreshes others will he himself be refreshed. So if you're going through a hard time, invest in others. God will refresh your soul. How do you do that, guys? How do you get to that level of living? It takes time. It takes commitment. A lot of us are complacent with our faith. As men of God, that's a, that's a word that I hear a lot. I've been guilty of it. I'm not up here to act like I got it all together because God is still doing a good work in me. There's a good chance I'm still going to miss an opportunity to share my faith or be bold, I'm still going to fall because we all fall short of God's glory. But it's by his grace that we're saved. Good people don't go to heaven, forgiven people do. That's what they say, right? So guys, we got to step out of complacency into consistency with our faith. What does that look like? It looks like coming to Iron Sharpens Iron, a group like this. It looks like making church a priority. It, look, it looks like getting into the word of God letting the word come alive and speak into your life, using scripture to share with others, to scripture to speak into your circumstance. That, that, that's what it comes from, through consistency. God will use consistency in your faith to grow your faith. I talk to guys a lot, and they have a lot of good intentions of stepping into uh, an area where they want to live more strongly for Christ, to live a better, you know, to be bolder in their faith, to strengthen their faith, and they talk about it, Right? Yeah, I've been meaning to do that. God's been impressing upon that uh, on my heart. But they never step out of those good intentions into intentional action. Good intentions to intentional action. What does that look like? Well, quit talking about it and get busy in your faith. Get into the word. Come to groups like this. Connect with small groups. Get yourself around believers. Make church a priority. How do you know church is a priority? Well, when you open up your calendar, is church something you fit in when your schedule permits? Or is church a priority on your calendar that you plan your schedule around, right? So back to my message, and really the centerpiece of my message is 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Let that settle in. Let me, let me back up. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Scripture is very clear. If you're not thanking God in the midst of any circumstance that you're in right now, are you in, are, you in will, are you in line with God's will? Let me repeat that. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will. So if you're not living a thankful life despite your circumstances, you're out of God's will. It's that simple, guys. So we can be thankful in difficult times knowing that God's in control. I, I mentioned Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work together for good. God calls us to a life of thanksgiving. And when we, when we spend just a few minutes gi giving thanksgiving to God, what's it do? It totally changes our men mentality. It changes our attitude and our outlook on life, right? I talked about how I was angry with God and I started looking at life through a, a different lens in my father's circumstance. It really changes your outlook. It's like you take a set of glasses off that you've been looking through with like a worldly view and you put the, a different set of glasses on where you have an eternal view of God and you're focused on his promises and heaven. That's what God really wants for us. Um, it's a battle, guys. It's a battle for our mind. 
You've got to stay consistent in your faith. You've got to be intentional in your faith. Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is. Again, we're talking about God's will here, right? What's his will? To give thanks in all circumstances. Why does it say to renew our minds? We need to renew our minds daily because God knows that the world is coming at us. The world is full of hate, division, anger, rage, like, you know, the things that are opposite of the fruits of the Spirit. So why is it important to open your Bible every single day to put on the armor of God to get your mind right? I just talked, I just said, if you thank God, take a few minutes to thank God, it totally changes your attitude and your outlook and probably your interactions with other people. Do you look at your interactions with other people as an opportunity to show them Jesus? Not necessarily talk about Jesus, but just show them Jesus. It should come across in your actions, your attitude, the words that you speak. You're different than the world, right? I often say live in such a way that you don't have to talk about Jesus because people see Jesus in you. Pretty powerful. Think about that. When you live in a way that you don't have to talk about, pe- that talk about Jesus because people will see Jesus in you, it really makes a difference. And what happens when people, once you show people Jesus, that'll create opportunities to tell them about Jesus because they see the difference in you and they're going to want a little piece of that. So let me, um, in my message, um, I, in my research online, I was trying to come up with some really good questions that we could talk about today in our small groups. But I came across something that said, what does it mean to give thanks when nothing seems to be going right? I just wanted to read this. I don't know the source of it, but it said, it means that I recognize that Jesus Christ is the source of anything good in my life. It is the gospel, the good news of what Jesus has done for me, that makes it possible for me to find joy in this life, no matter what each new day may bring. It means running to Christ when everything around me looks hopeless and finding my hope in him. It means that gratitude is at the heart of my relationship with God because it is gratitude that recognizes my place before a holy God as an undeserving recipient of his lavish grace. We don't deserve his grace, guys, but because of his love, because of the blood of Jesus, He's deemed us worthy of his grace. Lamentations 3, 21 through 24 says, This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope in him. His mercies are new every morning, guys. If you're going through something hard, I just want to encourage you guys to lean into the Lord. That's your cue to lean in. Dive into the word. Iron sharpens iron. Lean on some other guys. Allow them to come into your life to encourage you. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 again says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you. And when you start changing your outlook, instead of just being so consumed with your struggle to where... You transition that to just focusing on praising God and thanking God. He'll change your heart, guys. One of my favorite scriptures is also in 1 Thessalonians 5, 5.11. It says, therefore, encourage one another and lift each other up. Just in fact, as we're all doing here at Iron Sharpens Iron. You don't have any problems. You don't have any struggles. Praise God for that, guys. If you know someone that is, Step into their world and encourage them. Lift them up. God needs strong men in this world. Our families are looking at us. Our wives are looking at us. The world is looking at us. Our our friends are looking at us. What they're looking at is how we respond when times are tough. And God promises that if we turn our problems over to him, to not be anxious, to not worry about anything, He'll give us the peace that surpasses all understanding. That peace doesn't make sense to the world, but those that know Christ know exactly what I'm talking about, that even though you go through maybe the hardest of times, that peace that surpasses all understanding is available to each and every person in this room if you allow God to enter in. And part of that scripture says, he will guard your heart and mind. What is he guarding our heart and minds from? A worldview, Romans 12, 2 reminding, renew our minds, focus on the Lord. Capture that peace, guys, rest in it, and let that be what sustains you, because God will sustain you. So as we break into small groups, 
just wanted to give you guys a few more things that we can thank God for every day. We can thank God for pouring out his blessings on us. If we look for him, the blessings are there. We can thank God as the source of everything we need. We can thank God in every situ situation, knowing that he's working it for our good. We can be thankful because we know that God is working in our lives as our protector and our provider. And we can thank God for the hope and promise of heaven. Amen? Amen. So guys, thank you for listening to my testimony today. I hope I've encouraged your hearts today. If you need help, if you're going through something, don't leave here without receiving some encouragement from somebody because you, there's a lot of red tags in this room. Those are your small group leaders. You grab any one of those guys. You come to me. You come to Ted in the back. If you need some prayer, you need some encouragement, and you, sh you don't have to tell us everything you're going through. Just say, pray for me, and I'll, gla I'll gladly do it. Come see me. But I want you to leave here with a perspective of thanksgiving towards God, resting in his peace, and the reassurance of his promises, okay? Let me pray us out. Father God, thank you for this message. Thank you for your promises, Lord. Thank you for the hope that you give us. I pray as we leave here that we all are reminded, Lord, that you've called us to a, a heart and a spirit of thanksgiving and praise to you, that that is your will for us, Lord. If there's men struggling here, I pray that they get the encouragement they need today from the small groups, that you guide and direct our conversations, that you help us to sharpen one another, Lord, and you use our circumstances to glorify you for your greater good, Lord. We know that every circumstance is not good, but we know that you can use it for good and for your glory. And if we keep an eternal perspective and a focus on you, Lord. So thank you for these men. Bless our time together, Lord. Bless each and every man as they leave here today. And thank you again for this message and for your son, Jesus, and your mercies that are new every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.